Last Thursday marked one year since a white supremacist mob stormed the U.S. Capitol. Now, the white media, particularly on the left, has been very concerned because in that year, instead of seeing a moderation or a ratcheting down of the rhetoric, instead what they've seen is there's been a continuation of it. It's been maintained at that level. In the hours after the insurrection, you had a number of Republican members of Congress in the Senate who were actually speaking as if the insurrection was a bad thing, but it didn't take them very long before they decided to do a bout face on that one. Now, ever since that, we've been seeing the white media, particularly on the left, who have been expressing a lot of concern that apparently there's authoritarianism coming in. What about a breakdown in democracy? And you've been seeing a lot of black folks who have been talking a lot of language that doesn't make any sense at all for black people. Clowns like Benny Thompson and all these Negroes in Congress who speak like a bunch of sharecroppers fresh off the plantation. White supremacy loves its bootlicks saying things like, our government, we, democracy, the fall of democracy, we're going to lose this democracy, we will lose it. It was Malcolm who pointed out that you better beware whenever you got some Negro who comes up to you talking about we and us in relation to the things that are held by the dominant society. You're talking about a democracy that you have never experienced, that you've never enjoyed. How can you lose something you've never had? Now, I think that those on the white left are concerned. They should be. There's always been this element of violence that goes along with white supremacy because that's what it's based on. And it doesn't take much for them to decide that if the Negroes are too hard a nut to crack, well, they'll just go after each other. They're softer targets. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not to say that the right wing nuts who are attempting to try to engineer a permanent place in government for themselves This is not something that's going to benefit us. This has nothing to do with us. But the point that I'm trying to make is let's not get sucked into that whole rhetoric about our country and democracy and such. I made a video a couple of years back called George Washington, the first fascist. I pointed out to you that the United States is not a democracy and never has been. And for some of you smart, dumb Negroes out there, the United States is not a republic either. Thank you very much. The United States is and has always been an ethno-fascist state. I pointed out to you in my George Washington video how the fascies can be seen all over the classical architecture of Washington, D.C. and in several other places across the country, but particularly those federal institutions. From the Washington Monument to the House of Representatives, every time a president delivers the State of the Union address to the Congress... He's always framed by those fascists, but most people don't notice it because they don't know what it is. They just think there's some sort of ornate decoration. It's not. It's not just there for decoration. It's there to basically establish that this is a stamp of ownership of who and what is really in charge. Now, for those of you who don't know, the fascists was the symbol that Mussolini chose for his dictatorship. It's where the word fascism comes from. It was a symbol of ancient Rome. That's where he got it from. The fascis is a bundle of wooden rods bound together with an axe head protruding from the top. Now, the bound wooden rods symbolized unity, and the axe head symbolized force. Unity as a means of maximizing force. And is that not white supremacy in a nutshell? So that's what Benito Mussolini was on. That's where he got that idea from. But the United States had it way before Benito Mussolini even spawned out of his mother. The U.S. government had the fascists before Mussolini did. The U.S. was fascist before fascism was cool. Now, the symbols of fascism are gone in Italy, but they're still standing in the United States. But does that mean that all is well? Not so sure. The U.S., if we may continue the fascist analogy, still has the axe head for its fascies. It's the massive weapons arsenal, but those wooden rods are starting to come undone. Or at the very least, there's a few frayed strands among the ropes that are holding it together. Anti-black racism is the glue holding this fascist state together. It's the ropes that holds those wooden rods in place. In my last video about reparations, I told you about John Calhoun, the arch-anti-black racist of his day, and how he gave a Senate speech saying that the existing relation between blacks and whites in the South was the most solid and durable foundation for a stable institution. In other words, the society is based on this. He was talking about a hell of a lot more than just money. 
Anti-black racism was what holds this whole sick, perverted, satanic scheme together. The social order was based on a racial hierarchy. It's part of why I've always told you that white supremacy believes in giving tangible benefits, but it also believes in giving psychological benefits. And as LBJ himself was forced to concede, all you had to do was tell a white man that he was better than a black man and you wouldn't have to rob him, he would turn his pockets out for you willingly. The economic position of white Americans is eroding more and more by the day. They complain about it all the time. And yet you have a whole bunch of people who were so hot and bothered and champing at the bit to vote for Donald Trump. This is a man who, if his own bragging is to be believed, and it probably shouldn't be, this is a man who has a lifestyle that most white people in America have never had and could never have. If they tried to walk down any street in Donald Trump's exclusive gated communities, he'd have them arrested by the police if not shot. He was born into wealth. His infamous father had strong connections in the New York real estate scene. Most white people in America have never even gone to a private school, wouldn't even know where one was in their area, and yet Donald Trump, that's all he had. Most white people in America have never ever been outside the United States. Donald Trump, he's been marrying broads from outside the U.S. He runs all over the place. On someone else's dime, no doubt. But my point is, Donald Trump has absolutely nothing in common with the average white American, and yet you had a bunch of them who were falling over their footsteps and ready to overthrow the government on his behalf, all of them screaming, he's just like us. And what did the orange man do in his four years of white supremacist misrule in the White House? What did he do for those mouth-frothing hordes who couldn't wait to topple the government on his orange majesty's behalf? What did he do for all of those white supremacists out there? What did he do for all those people who are saying that he's just like us? He didn't do anything. In his four years, their economic condition didn't change, didn't get better. They were not elevated one iota. They'll tell themselves that they were. That's garbage. For a lot of them, they just decided, well, now I'm going to choose to notice. Their position hadn't changed. But Donald Trump learned a long time ago that he didn't actually have to do anything for people. All he had to do was give them a pat on the back, some insincere praise. I think it was Keith Olbermann himself who said that when you met Donald Trump, at least before 2015, he'd be the main one who's shaking your hand and it's all about you. Yes, he understood a long time ago if you're quite gregarious with people, if you're effusive with the praise, that's going to make a lot of people feel good about you just based on that. You don't actually have to do anything. So psychological benefits can be far more important than tangible benefits, especially when you're dealing with a privileged section of the society who the nation has already given everything to. The dominant society already has all the money and power they could want. What they want at this point is constant reassurance that all the goodies, giveaways, and guarantees, perks, and privileges that they receive for being classified as white aren't going to go away. They're demanding solid and unchanging guarantees from the government that their position is going to remain frozen in place forever. They didn't earn their position in the society. They know they didn't earn it. They know it was given to them. And they're furious that this might have even a scintilla of a chance of changing. You see, the people in the society who America's done everything for who rioted at the Capitol, these people have been conditioned to be ultra hypersensitive to anything that even remotely seems like it could change their place in the racial hierarchy. That's why they're so all consumed with trends, where are things going, etc. Control today and tomorrow is crucial to them, and making sure their progeny remain in control is even more important. Legacy may rank as a distant 10th or 12th in the priorities of black people, but for these white supremacists, is number one, or at the very least, a very close number two. Now, a very popular narrative that you'll hear mostly on the right, but also echoed a lot on by those who claim to be on the left, is that these people who stormed the Capitol, these were poor, downtrodden, ignorant folks who just didn't know any better all the excuses. Whenever some person who's part of the dominant society commits a crime, well, it really wasn't their fault. They were misled somehow. They, were, they had a mental disorder. Here come the excuses. But one of the big lies that have been told is that these are people who have been economically disadvantaged. These were people who were left out somehow. That's a crock of bull. And the people saying it know it. That's the reason why the white media hasn't spent a whole lot of time talking about the economic profile of these terrorists who attacked the Capitol. But the white media and the authorities did perform a study, which The Atlantic reported on. The headline is misleading, though. These rioters are exactly like all the other white supremacists of yesteryear, from the KKK to the present. I'll explain that in a moment. 
But in this piece, some researchers at the University of Chicago analyzed all the known data about the people who stormed the Capitol, and what they found was 40% of them are business owners or hold white-collar jobs. They work as CEOs, shop owners, doctors, lawyers, IT specialists, and accountants. Only about 9% of them were unemployed. So we can lay to rest the white supremacist lie that these are people who everything was taken from. They lost everything. They were right because they're losing everything, losing everything. Give me a break. And when you look at that list of professions that these people do, these are people you know, people that you've dealt with on a daily basis. Shop owners, doctors, lawyers, IT specialists, accountants. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that more than a few of you looked and said, wait a minute, I know that guy. He comes from my area. And a tragic number of you probably looked and said, oh, my God, I've done business with this idiot. This is who was storming the Capitol. These are not people who were wronged in any way. There was no member of their family murdered by the police. These people were not run out of their homes or had their neighborhoods destroyed. These are not people who they haven't had their lives in their hands. These are people who have spent every day in complete and thorough control of everything that happens to them and everything that happens to black people around them. And also significant to note, some 52% of the insurrectionists came from blue counties that Biden comfortably won in 2021. Well, I guess these are some of those Biden Republicans that Biden and Rahm Emanuel and the rest of the DNC have been so hot and bothered about acquiring. We need to get some Biden Republicans. Yeah, and those Biden Republicans came to pay him a visit on January 6th. A large number of them came from blue counties or from counties that are trending blue. Like, for example, Collin County, Texas. That's important because that's where this goofball Jenna Ryan came from, this grinning clown. She's from Frisco, Texas, which has been trending blue for the last 20 years, with Democratic votes there almost on par with the Republican votes. You'll recall Jenna Ryan, one of the downtrodden, unheard, invisible voters that Donald Trump was talking about, took a private jet to the insurrection. And after she got caught and identified by police, she went on Twitter and told everybody, not going to jail, got blonde hair, white skin, not going to jail. And for the most part, she's right. All she got was a mere 60 days, which is probably going to get knocked down. Wouldn't be surprised if she's out in 30. And on top of that, it's only a misdemeanor, no felony for her. And it's been that way for most of those insurrectionists. I mean, these people are so confident in the fact that white supremacy and white privilege are still going to be in place, even after they try to overthrow the government, they're looking and going, well, hell, nothing happened in the Civil War to those insurrectionists, nothing's going to happen to us. They have an unspoken understanding, even with their white political opponents, that maintaining white solidarity, that's more important than anything. That's how Abraham Lincoln could lose hundreds of thousands of men in the Civil War and then turn around and tell all of those people in the North, well, we're moving forward with malice toward none. Yeah, white solidarity must be maintained at all costs. This woman deals in real estate in Texas took a private jet to the insurrection. This is your poor, downtrodden white masses who have had enough because they've been locked out and shut out and they've lost everything while they're on their private jets and they're bragging about their great jobs and businesses that they own because, you know, they've lost everything, don't you know? These people, these are the ones who America has done everything for. And it's always been this way. Now, we do need to correct something right quick that I told you about earlier. The researcher who compiled the information about these terrorists had a headline on the piece that was saying the Capitol ex rioters are not extremists. Now, the thing to remember is the guy who led this effort to compile this data, he's a political science professor at the University of Chicago, and his assistant is a senior research associate there, too. Neither one of them's a historian. If they had been, they wouldn't have written that headline. Because The Atlantic had published a piece just the month before and updated on April of that year stating that the KKK and other white supremacist terror groups that formed after Reconstruction were also comprised of working class and middle and upper class racists as well. When the KKK formed, according to historian Eric Foner, its leadership included planters, merchants, lawyers, and even ministers. In New Orleans, carpenters, grocers, and tinsmiths belonged to the White League, as did laborers and stevedores. But historian Justin Nystrom also added, even more common were professional men from Factors Row, clerks, accountants, sugar and cotton factors, weighers, and lawyers. 
So we see the profile of the average KKK white league. All of these white supremacists running around in the 19th and 20th century is the same as the ones in the 21st. The apple don't fall far from the tree. So it's a lie that these white supremacists killing and murdering black people and trying to overthrow governments and such are just a bunch of down and out hicks from the sticks. No, these are some of the most well paid, some of the most educated people in the entire society, the people who the society's done everything for. Now, the white media does mention that the impetus seems to be that these counties that these people came from were undergoing demographic shifts. Well, as we all know, if the demographic shift happens to be people from south of the border, well, before it's all over, water seeks its own levels, so we can pretty much tell where that one's going to go. There's going to be the predictable anger and rage by the dominant society, but as they've also proven in places like Latin America, before it's all over, a lot of those folks coming from south of the border, they'll get with the program and they will accept a lower place in the society, same way that they did in the places that they came from. But the point of this video address is to make sure that everyone understands that the real reason that you have so many people from the white media on the left who are saying, oh, threat to democracy, threat to democracy, it's not democracy that they're scared is going to fall apart. It is the white solidarity necessary to maintain white supremacy in this country that they're really scared is fracturing. They have to maintain it. If these white supremacists didn't have us to hate and attack, then they would go right back to attacking each other like they were doing in Europe before they broke into Africa, the same way they almost annihilated each other in two world wars. And they didn't stop trying to kill each other because they had discovered decency. They only paused because they had created weapons so destructive they could wipe out the entire planet. The white supremacists have been in this position before. Following the Civil War, that was what all of the violence and the marauding by those white supremacist gangs of thugs was about. They wanted reassurances that, hey, just because the black folks are out of the cotton fields, that doesn't mean that the racial hierarchy is going to change. And what happened was the government said, you're right, we'll go ahead if you guys will stop all of this shooting that you've been doing. You know, just don't cause any more problems and we'll make sure you're reassured that your position isn't going to change. And that reassurance took the form of making sure that whatever progress black folks had made after Reconstruction was going to be systematically destroyed. Attacking us was the reassurance that the white supremacists wanted. And the government was only too eager to give it. And that's exactly what's forming right now. So for all you people out there who are buying into the white media's coverage, there's authoritarian, fascistic dictatorship on the right coming up. What's happening is they're having a conversation. Not literally, but in figurative terms, there's a conversation going on. We want reassurances. And before it's all over, you're going to be having the white government saying, oh, reassurances indeed. What do you think all the caterwauling and whining about woke and wokeism is by the Democrats? They've been seeing this stuff coming. What they're doing is they're giving the assurances. That's why you had so many police who were at the Capitol insurrection. A lot of them are terrified now. They're seeing more and more cops go to prison. This has never happened in the country's history. They're looking and going, wow, this has become habit forming. And a lot of them are terrified, and justifiably so, that they're going to wind up with a prison cell right beside Derek Chauvin and Amber Geiger. So they were at the Capitol basically registering their terror and their fear that they're going to be punished. Because after all, one of the perks and privileges of being classified as white is the law doesn't touch you. White immunity from law is the main perk of white supremacy. That's how Jenna Ryan could go on Twitter and accurately say, hey, I got blonde hair, blue eyes, white skin. I'm not going to jail. 60 days on a misdemeanor, give me a break. This woman has had no consequences inflicted on her at all. The principle of guaranteeing that everyone classified as white will not be touched, that's one of the most crucial ideals of this country. They've spent hundreds of years solidifying the practice that people classified as white won't be touched. To the point now, they can brag to you and say, we know it. Yeah, we know it's two tiers and we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure it stays that way. The courts have been strident and blatant in their racist bias. The DA's deliberately lowballed charges against white offenders. We've been seeing this pitiful parade going on for the last year or so. Dismissed charges, ask the judge to give low sentences. The judges are even worse. The U.S. doesn't have courts. It has a racial incarceration machine for black people. People acting shocked and amazed to see how the system actually works. 
And the people who are pretending to be the most shocked and surprised, they're the ones who fought to make sure it's like this. They're the ones who made it where the judicial system is staffed and run by a bunch of dyed-in-the-wool racists who don't merely sympathize with white supremacists like the ones who attacked the Capitol. These judicial administrators are backing them up every step of the way. These white liberals you see on TV and in Congress, they now desperately need for the laws to apply to people classified as white. They need the courts to actually punish these white supremacists, but they're not. This is not a failure of the system. This is the system working exactly the way that it was designed. And now you got some people who are saying, well, we need to call an audible on this one. We need to do something different. After hundreds of years of building and reinforcing and propping up and defending a system of blatant racial bigotry and discrimination that has one tier for those classified as white and another tier for black people, now they're saying we need to be different? Little late in the day for that one, ain't it? The U.S. attorneys are all a pack of anti-black racists who routinely give black defendants huge sentences on trumped-up phony charges. They fought for laws to make it where basically all a prosecutor has to do is simply accuse you of something, and that's 80% of the conviction right there. The federal judges routinely hand down the hardest sentences to black defendants, regardless of whether they're innocent or not. These U.S. attorneys and judges have been the defenders and guarantors of white immunity from law since the country's founding. And after 245 years of refusing to apply the law to those classified as white, you got white liberals on TV and in Congress who think they ought to start now just because it's their lives that are at stake. Oh, so now there's a problem. Something needs to be done. The system is suicidal. It doesn't value preservation above all things. It values upholding white supremacy above all things. The administrators of white supremacy would much rather die than to have to give up their power. What some of these bootlicking scumbags like the Congressional Immigrant Caucus, uh, I mean the Congressional Black Caucus, didn't count on is that the same white power brokers who these bootlicks like to yuck it up with and who give them money would also send a bloodthirsty mob to the Capitol to kill them. That's how you got clowns like Negro Jim Clyburn and Benny Thompson, these idiots who talk like freaking sharecroppers. I doubt that their IQ is higher than their shoe size, but these guys, they like the fact that a lot of these well-heeled CEOs and business people give them contributions or at least pretend that they can hold down their lunch while they're having a conversation with them, and then those same people turn around and send a bloodthirsty mob to come and run them out of Congress. What, you think those people in the CBC didn't actually recognize a number of those folks who stormed the Capitol? I'm sure they recognized a few of them. To be willingly blind to white supremacy only serves to make you his next victim. White supremacists have spent hundreds of years being pals with black people, even having sexual relations with black people, even children by them. And then those same white supremacists have no problem immediately getting out of bed and killing those same black people or in the past having them sold at auction in a pinch. Betrayal is not an occasional feature of white supremacy. It's standard operating procedure for them. You had members of the Congressional Black Caucus ducking for cover on January 6th, even had one of them who was praying her heart out because that's all she could do. Now, if they had done what their black constituents demanded that they do for over 50 plus years and hold white supremacists to account, then they wouldn't have needed to be praying for their lives and they never would have been under threat either. The bootlicks are as suicidal as their white paymasters. They've practiced obeying white power all their worthless lives. Now they're in a situation where they need massa to call off the dogs, but they don't know how to make that happen because they still want to obey massa. If the proponents of the big lie are really such a threat, then why is it that Democrats are not tripping over themselves to get black people on board? If the alarmist rhetoric from the white left was actually true, if they honestly believe that democracy itself hangs by a thread, this time two years from now we're going to be in a fascist dictatorship, oh my god, America is goose-stepping its way toward authoritarianism. If they actually believe that each day brings this country closer to the end of democracy then why are these Democrats attacking the very black people who are the only ones who can preserve it? If the stakes are actually as high as the white left and the white media from CNN and MSNBC are claiming it is, then it ought to be a no-brainer that they ought to be coming up to black people and saying, let's make a deal. What is it you guys want? What is it we got to do to make sure you turn out? Democracy hangs by a thread, don't you know? Why do they not come to us with tangibles? 
Instead, what they're doing is they're making it very clear they're going to be attacking all of black people's demands under the lie of wokeism. And when we have Republicans who are putting laws in place that are meant to disenfranchise or at least meant to be political barbs thrown at black people, you don't see the Democrats saying we're going to reciprocate on that. Oh, it wasn't until the Supreme Court handed down a ruling on abortion. Then you had California and New York say, well, we're going to retaliate legislatively. There's going to be legislative retaliation for that one. We're prepared to go to the mat for abortion. Because, you know, white feminists, that's what they approve. That's important for them. But when it comes to things that black people are demanding, they're not going to the mat on anything. There will be no mirror legislation passed in blue states. They can't get any support for that. Can't get a full head of steam for that. Oh, but they want black people's votes, though. Black people are the backbone of the Democratic Party. They just won't do anything for black people. They're dang sure not pulling out all the stops. So when you got these good white liberals talking about democracy hangs by a thread, democracy? What democracy? And for whom? First of all, black people have never experienced democracy in this country. As Dr. John Henry Clark said, America has never had democracy, and if it ever actually did have democracy, then it would fall in less than a day. That's what the Civil War, that's what the Civil Rights Movement and the January 6th insurrection were about. You had a number of people in the society, the majority in fact, who were determined there will be no democracy in the United States. The U.S. is an ethno-fascist state and it must remain that way. As with so many things, Dr. John Henrik Clark was absolutely right. As black people, we cannot lose democracy when we've never had it. When have black people been able to enjoy their full rights in this country? Without anyone infringing upon it or impeding it or trying to lock us up or trying to make sure that we're locked out of whatever formal opportunities exist. When have black people ever had the ability to say, I live in a democracy? You look at the life experience of that good white liberal who's trying to tell you democracy is at stake, and then you look at your own position and your own experience, and you look at it like night and day. They're talking about something completely different than what you're talking about. When you say democracy as a black person, you're speaking in aspirational terms. I don't want to lose a chance that this country might actually start acting like a democracy toward me. I don't want to lose a chance that I might actually live in a democracy in this country. You're talking about a hypothetical. You've never lived in a democracy in this country. This country's never been a democracy. And a lot of those good white liberals who are caterwauling and going to hysterics right now, they've been some of the main people making sure that you don't. They've walked lockstep with those same right-wing extremists. When it comes to black people, the white left and the white right have no problem finding common ground so they can make sure that their position remains frozen in place and that ours doesn't change either. Bill Moyer said that the news can be defined as the information you need to know to keep your freedom. But as I've always told you, white privilege is an entirely different reality from the one that we live in, and it's an entirely different mentality than ours. So we understand that, as Dr. Clark said, everything that moves under white supremacy moves for its power. So when Bill Moyer says freedom, he doesn't mean freedom the same way that black people think of it. When we say freedom, we mean the right to live our lives free from fear and attack or coercion and free from others trying to lock us out of whatever opportunities life has to offer. That's justice. That's what we're talking about. But when Bill Moyer says it, as a white man, he means something different. Very different. He's talking about the dominant society here. Their idea of freedom and such is very different than ours. They already have all the very things that you and I recognize as being just the bare bones basics of democracy and freedom. They already have all those things. But these are things that we're looking at and going, man, that would be just paradise, heaven on earth, if we could have just the very basic things that white people are given and are allowed to have and that we are forcefully prevented from having. When Bill Moyer says freedom, we recognize that what he means is power. He's not just talking about the ability to live your life in peace. He's talking about something beyond that. They already have the ability to live their lives free from attack. Hell, a lot of them spend all their time attacking us. Black people are prevented from having even the most basic elements of citizenship and upward mobility. If a politician tried to come up to white people and offer them the things that black people demand, white people would tune them out. At best, they would tune them out. And at worst, turn their backs on them or attack them and say, you're offering us stuff we already got. You're not putting anything on the table. Most people classified as white in the U.S. are not at all concerned about the things that black people routinely have to take to the streets and demand because they already have them. These are small things to them. What 
What concerns them are the goodies, giveaways, and guarantees that have been handed to them, the glue that holds white supremacy together. That's what concerns them. That's what they're panicked about. They're panicked on the right that those systems of goodies and giveaways are coming to an end, and on the left, they're panicked that black people are not going to stop making demands, that we're just not going to just go back to twiddling our thumbs and business as usual. So understand that when they say democracy, they're not saying the same thing as you and me. Just like when they say freedom, what they mean is power. Roger Ailes certainly understood that principle. That's why he spent over a quarter century trying to start a right-wing TV propaganda station. Most black people can't imagine spending more than 25 hours on something, let alone a third of their lives. But that's what Roger Ailes did. But what made him think that there would be an audience for that? Because the dominant society is the group who has been allowed to wield power in this country. So they understand the need to be plugged into whatever streams of information will allow them to maintain that power. They want media that is one part hate speech, one part enemies list, and 100% white power. They want to know someone is able and willing to stay on top of whatever threat there might be to their position. That's what Roger Ailes offered them. An angry mob of bigots and privileged casual racists who wanted to be reassured that their place in the society was not only justified, but was also ordained by God. The bad guys know their position is based on lies, which means the House of White Supremacy was based on sand. As a result, they're terrified of anything that could even remotely be taken as a threat. This is why they follow us, troll us, monitor us, and they're psychopathically obsessed with us. They have to be. They're trapped on the horns of a dilemma. Black, as the opposite of white, has given them a unifying principle, something they can all agree on and rally around. But it's also proven that their position is not based on morality, but rather on brutality. And you can't justify that. So the goal is to oppress us out of existence. This never-ending string of attempts and strategies to try to economically strangle us. Deprive people of resources and those people will wither on the vine pretty quick. But the dominant society knows exactly what they're doing. They want someone to tell them that their psychopathic anti-black racism is justified. Don't just tell them they're not racist, but also tell them, well, even if you are, you're justified. And then remind them day after day of what threat is coming from black people. But here's the twist. It's not just Fox News. You see the same from the so-called leftist white media, too. In February 2019, you'll recall Joy Reid used her sideshow as a platform to attack the new voices of black media. She called herself having a segment or two that was attacking our talking points, saying that anyone talking about reparations was a Russian bot. You recall that? She didn't dare say who was saying this. Because if they did, then they would have no choice but to confront us directly, and they're not going to do that because they know they'll lose. This was the white media acknowledging that what we were doing stung them. What we've been saying has been getting through, but as they always do, they sent out a black flunky to do their bidding. They didn't want a white person to be the one coming at us, not at first. So they sent out Joke Reed in the pathetic hope that this clown could break the ice and she would be the one who would lay the groundwork for the white on-air personalities to come in and go in on us. Ignoring us out of existence didn't work, so they're pathetically hoping they can delegitimize us out of existence by getting people to reject our words. This way they could attack us without having to fight us directly. And how well did that go? Well, only four months later, the same Democrats who said that anyone talking about reparations was a Russian bot, they held a phony reparations hearing in the House of Representatives. You'll notice that Joy Reid didn't have anything to say about that. No more accusations of being Russian bots. And the heifer hasn't criticized the word since. All of a sudden, the people saying reparations aren't Russian bots. Interesting how that works. The threat that we are presenting is that we have black people making demands that require white supremacy to give up its power. As Dr. John Henry Clark taught us, those are the only kinds of demands that are worthwhile. Those are the only kind of demands that matter. Integrating a lunch counter doesn't require white supremacy to lose power. Integrating a sports league doesn't require white supremacy to lose power. Integrating a school doesn't require white supremacy to lose power. Sorry to those of you who might have thought that it did. 
The white media has no problem putting on TV shows and movies that tell you integrating a school or a lunch counter or a sports team was delivering a blow to white supremacy because that's what they want you to believe. And as long as you march in circles or you're begging some white power broker to give you a job or let you sit beside him, that means they're in charge. You'll think you're accomplishing something when in reality you're not changing anything. It's in their interest to glorify do-nothing social climbers like John Lewis because he was merely looking to get a government job for himself, and that's what he got. And just because some bigots and racists complained that their kid had to sit beside a black child in school, or wasn't it nice before they let the niggers into this movie theater or something, so what? The white supremacists complain about everything. So let's be clear. What's at stake here is not democracy. No such creature exists in the United States. What is at stake here is white solidarity. Take a look at the last 150 years. Whenever white solidarity broke down, so did white control. In the months leading up to the Civil War, the Union government basically agreed to all the South's demands to maintain slavery. But white solidarity had frayed to the point that the good old boys down south were so full of themselves that they opted to break white solidarity anyway. And the result? The end of chattel slavery. And black people left the plantations and went into the cities. John Q. Citizen could no longer own a black person, though, as we all know from the 13th Amendment, Uncle Sam could. Then a hundred years later, black demands upon white power brought about a second break in white solidarity. The result, the Civil Rights Movement and Voting Rights Acts. Black people now were more able to enter the political arena and more places in the social arena. There's been a rear guard action for the last 50 years to make sure that what few gains had seemed to be made were only symbolic and to prevent any more ground from being lost. This has been basically a long-form version of what happened in the years immediately following the end of Reconstruction. Now, you haven't had the destruction of the black townships and such, at least not the way that they were done at the turn of the 20th century. Instead of having marauding gangs of white supremacists show up and burn the place down and lynch black people and the federal government backing them up, instead what you've had is you've had laws passed. They've been doing it through the government. The body count has been as high as anything that took place in the years following the end of Reconstruction. Only difference is, you had people who were telling themselves that they had the ability to influence it when in truth, they didn't really have that ability at all. Now, white power is under pressure again, and as we've seen last summer and most recently in Kenosha and with the conviction of Kim Potter, white solidarity is under threat of fracturing yet again. They're terrified of what changes we could bring about if that's allowed to happen. So we see the mouthpieces of white power putting away all pretense and revealing themselves. The so-called leftists are handing out an olive branch to the right. Hey, guys, remember 150 years ago? Come on, we made nice before. Let's do it again. We'll let you go ahead and start beating up on the negras. We'll, we'll, all of this stuff that we were pretending to do on their behalf, we'll go ahead and withdraw if you guys just calm down. Their outward rhetoric claims to be worried about democracy, but their message is a racial one, not a political one. Making sure that black people are handed over to the blatant white supremacists to be beat up upon, that's going to be the sign that white solidarity will be maintained. Don't worry, we're backing up. There's no full court press to make identifying and punishing white supremacy a priority. They're just keeping up the constant, we need unity. As we've seen so many times before, as we see every time, they'll be making nice with each other before it's all over. So for those of you who are actually chewing your fingernails and going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, please calm down. Make no mistake, there's behind the scenes meetings between the two to assuage the white rights fears and anger and reassure them that black oppression is still the order of the day. What we've seen so far with the Cajun Skeletor James Carville and Negro Jim Clyburn and Ron DeSantis is simply the outward messaging. The two major parties don't agree on anything, not even to sit in the same room together if you let the white media tell the story, and yet when it comes to making sure the thugs in blue can kill black people with impunity, they all get behind that. Anti-black racism is a bipartisan issue. I don't care what the white media tells you. They don't really have a problem with Trump per se. This is the same white media who said absolutely nothing about Trump's racism for 40 years. They knew about the housing discrimination suits against him in the 70s. Didn't bother them then. 
They knew about the racist ad against the Central Park Five that he took out in the 90s. Didn't bother them then. They knew about the sexual assault allegations. Didn't bother them. And they said nothing and treated him like any other celebrity. Sure, he's loud and flamboyant, but that's just Don. What are you going to do? They played right along with him and they were happy to do so. So please don't fall for the white media con that they only just figured out in the last few years that, oh my God, Donald Trump is this mouth-frothing white supremacist anti-black racist. Who would have known? I mean, there was nothing to indicate it. The problem here isn't that they disagree with Trump or what he does. Their problem is that he went too far too fast. Donald Trump is not a political problem for white supremacy. He's a logistical problem. He stepped up the timetable, and as a result, he got a lot of people on alert way too early. They wanted to boil us alive, like the frog that sits in a pot of water. You turn up the heat slowly and the frog will simply sit there until it burns to death. Trump, however, turned up the heat too fast, and the frog took to the streets, and it was the cities that burned. The white media and the white power brokers behind it want to see an apartheid state put in place, a final solution to the Negro problem. But if you're going to maintain the fraud of America as the moral leader of the world, soft power that the rest of the world should follow the U.S. because of its morality and its progress, well, if you're going to be putting up that fraud, that charade, if you're going to maintain that, you're not going to be able to institute an apartheid state overnight. Not without black people noticing and not without the international community noticing. There have been plenty of murders of black people by police and any citizen who wanted to run up on us, but it was precisely Trump's unfiltered, unapologetic, racist boasting and encouraging of that behavior that made people take notice and say, well, we better do something because of how outre he was about it. That's why I said Trump being in the White House was a good thing for us, because now people couldn't deny it anymore. White supremacy was front page news. Everybody had to look at it and see this. Low key racist, polite racists like Biden are far more effective at promoting the slow genocide precisely because they pretend to be against it. People get confused or rather complacent. They're willing to sit on their hands because this guy doesn't seem like he hates black people. He just can't do anything for black people. That's all. Bill Clinton doesn't talk like Strom Thurmond. So why did he push the 94 crime bill? Why did he sign it? Why is he ignoring black people telling him how much harm it's causing? George W. Bush doesn't seem as racist as his father. He didn't run any Willie Horton ads. But why is he making it easier for the police to buy military-grade equipment? Barack Obama says he knows what it means to be a black man. But he attacks and insults black men every chance he gets, sits down with racist police who attack his friends and does absolutely nothing about police and racist thugs who gun down black children. It's a sad fact, but most people will simply sit in the pot and let themselves burn to death. Can the masses of people be made to move for their own survival? Sure, but only if it hurts enough. So believe it or not, and I don't say this with any glee, but the truth of the matter is under the circumstances, yeah, Donald Trump equals a net benefit as far as getting people to get off their behinds and understand the problem. Now, what gets certain people on the white right and the white left a little bit perturbed with Trump is that he wants to see the apartheid state come about on his watch. It's on his personal bucket list. So all this phony rhetoric by the white media and the Democrats about democracy being in peril, it's a pile of crap. The white media hates democracy. The mega millionaires and billionaires who own the white media and who control the DNC use the political parties and their white outlets to prevent democracy from ever coming about. Trump antagonized people. He made it where the racism was so blatant, so undeniable that people recognized the threat. They couldn't deny it anymore. It hurt enough. Problem is, people also have a suicidal tendency to want to be led. This makes them extremely vulnerable to some individual or political party who comes along saying, we've heard your concerns, we feel your pain, we're going to do something about it, leave it to us. Tragically, most people in the U.S. who hear that will go back to sitting on their hands again. They get mad, but they're also looking for a way to get out of having to do the hard work that change actually demands. Democracy is not at stake. White unity is. The threat isn't fascism, it's the threat of white nationalism becoming so undeniable that enough people decide to destroy it. People talked about qualified immunity being done away with, but look at the racist trash who have been put in jail so far just in the last year and a half alone. 
Not one city or state has gotten rid of their qualified immunity statutes. And yet we see cops consistently going to jail now for harming black people. Now, of course, this number is only a paltry handful, but at least it's happening. And the sentences are sticking. So we see the problem is not and never was qualified immunity. That was just a red herring that they were hiding behind, something that they were saying to you so they had an excuse for why they just, that we just can't do anything, you see. It's the law, you see. It's the law, you see. Well, no laws have changed, and yet we see cops going to prison. What does that tell you? But these changes, minor as they are, only happened because the people took to the streets last year and made it clear that if the government's not going to stop these murders, then the people will. And the governments across the country were forced to at least put a few of them away. Of course, they know that now that people have seen that it can be done, now that we've seen it's been done in a large number of cases, with or without qualified immunity, you're not going to be able to screen qualified immunity anymore. Notice how you haven't heard anybody talk about that. Oh, police reform bill, yeah, but you're not going to get any traction out of saying, we're going to end qualified immunity. Hell, we're able to put cops in prison without qualified immunity. You're not going to be able to hide behind that excuse anymore. Which is where the new crop of bootlick apologists for white supremacy like Eric Adams and Key Chance Sewell come in. These clowns are white supremacy's plan B, and the B stands for bootlick. At first they were saying, there's nothing we can do, and now you got Key Chance Sewell saying, we're bringing back stop and frisk. And you got Eric Adams saying, well, black people need to be policed. And what about all those white supremacists in the police departments? Aren't we going to, where's the plan to make sure that you purge the police departments of these white supremacists? There is no plan and no talking about it either. And the white media makes sure that Eric Adams and Key Chance Sewell are the bill of the ball. So we see what's happening here. They're going to be pivoting from there's nothing we can do to there's nothing we're going to do. We're not doing anything. So understand what's going on, family. Make enough of the victims of white supremacy scared enough or angry enough, and they'll start to fight back. The U.S. was hemorrhaging international support last year to the point that even Chinese officials were taunting the U.S. on Twitter. So the U.S. lost its ability to lecture China on human rights violations. Soft power was being lost. Because you can't send in the Marines on everything. There's sometimes where you got to be able to get people to go along with something because you've persuaded them that you're right. That's where soft power comes in. Soft power is also those briefcases full of U.S. dollar bills. But white supremacy is only under pressure when the people are mobilized. Thanks to Trump, it finally hurt enough. But with Biden, we see the old life slowly returning. But last year, the fear of God was put into those white supremacists. What they saw was not merely a possibility of change. They saw change actually being put upon the system. They actually saw things getting done, and they didn't have the ability to stop it. They saw justice was a real threat. The U.S. was in danger of becoming a democracy. That's what they were terrified about. And don't let anyone tell you any different. Good night, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. George Montgomery, John Womack, Croy Flint, Nora Brown, and Hildman Gallo. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black empowerment only exists because of you.